This is Politics and Media 101. I'm Jeff Browning. The Stanford Internet Observatory was created to study abuse of the internet in real time, and more specifically, to study digital trust and safety in a way that's brand new to computer science. Renee DeResta is the observatory's technical research manager. We talked to her about what makes something go viral online, what happens when that force collides with safety or germ theory in real life, the difference between free speech and free reach, and the term ampliganda. These are all things Renee has written about. She's one of the most widely respected authors around on this topic. You can read her work in Wired and The Atlantic. As a reminder, all of our events are taped 100% live. Anyone who wants to can join to ask our guests a question. For more on how to join us live, past episodes, visit us at pm101.live, where you can find all that and more. Without any further ado, let's roll the tape. So, you know, you've been involved in researching the spread of misinformation since before the concepts of misinformation and disinformation hit the public discourse and the fiery pitch it has right now. Can you share like how you first got started with this and got into? Yeah, I was um, I was really interested in the vaccine conversation. So my son was born in December 2013 and I was living in San Francisco at the time. And in SF, you have to do this thing where you like put your kid's name on, uh, you know, the very few spots for preschools and things for daycares. Um, and so you have to go and you, you put your child's name down like long in advance. And I didn't really know which, um, you know, which one to pick. So one of the things I went looking at, I'd read some articles, you know, from back in the day about how like even Google's work daycare had really low vaccination rates. And I didn't want to put my my son into that environment. So I spent a bunch of time um, looking at these numbers. California Department of Public Health has all of this data. It's very transparent. It goes 10 years back. And I really got interested in that, um, in that data set. I was just like really captivated by it because what it showed, if you pulled down all the, you know, the 10 years worth of data, you could see the trends emerge. And I said, like made a bunch of graphs and I kind of chunked it according to a bunch of different things, you know, demographics, assembly district, Senate district, um, you know, was it more Republican or democratic districts? Was it more, uh, private school versus public school? Cause you could pull down the kindergarten data sets too. Um, why did schools with the name Waldorf in them have <laughs> vaccination rates like in the 30th percentile in some cases? And so I was just kind of fascinated by the vaccine conversation. And then interestingly, the more time I spent with it um, on the internet, uh, I kept getting targeted with vaccine-related conversation, with vaccine-related groups and things uh, on Facebook and, and on Twitter. And the Facebook recommendation engine, you know, I was like, I made my own baby food. I did some things that I think count as like crunchy parenting. And I had joined some of those groups and I was getting constantly referred into these anti-vaccine groups. It was just all that I was seeing was these, you know, these pushes to join anti-vaccine groups and backyard chickens. That was the other one that I kept getting. Um, Would you like to raise chickens in your backyard, Renee? Uh, (laughs) And again, I was like, this is fascinating. Like, this 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 platform has this perception of who I am. It's not accurate at all, but you know, clearly I'm clicking on things, so I'm feeding it because I'm like horrified by these suggestions. So I totally go and I click on them, like, what's this? You know? Um, and I started feeling like it was just watching this this, you know, the the data sets that I was seeing with these decreasing vaccination rates over time, the uh, the extent to which crunchy parenting communities seem to have like this large anti-vaccine contingent, the complete lack of pushback, which was really remarkable. Nobody was ever, you know, no recommendation engine was pushing me pro-vaccine groups. And I started searching for them and realized like they're not really there. They didn't really exist. And so I started feeling like I had kind of stumbled upon this um, this weird, you know, little kind of portion of the internet that then all of a sudden became terribly relevant because there was a measles outbreak in California. It started at Disneyland. You know, you may have heard it called the Disneyland measles outbreak. And about 225 people or so um, got sick in that in that outbreak. And it spread to a couple neighboring states. And so all of a sudden, my little view into this weird niche community became um, kind of remarkably relevant as, you know, all of a sudden these, we had to decide what, what was California going to do about schools with vaccination rates in the 30th percentile. Um, you know, 36% of kids with MMR vaccines when there was a measles outbreak and, you know, how, how might we head off the next one? So 
anyway, that was um, that was kind of how I started doing a lot of work to understand this. As we tried to pass the bill in California to eliminate what were called personal belief exemptions, which this is highly relevant all of a sudden now in the context of COVID vaccines. Um, but as we were trying to decide what exemptions to school vaccine requirements children should have, uh, all of a sudden it became, you know, there's hashtag SB277 to talk about the bill. And I really like inserted myself into that conversation and then had the fascinating experience of, you know, being doxxed and being harassed and <laughs> the various like trust and safety angle to the whole thing was um, kind of brought into stark relief too. And I just, it was kind of like, it consumed me for the better part of like seven months actually was, was just spent first kind of studying these data sets, then studying these communities, then being kind of sucked down this, you know, this rabbit hole. And gradually as time went on, interestingly, even after the bill was passed and I stopped paying so much attention to the anti-vaccine movement, um, my recommendations continued to give me things like Pizzagate and then subsequently QAnon. And so I, I just really had this feeling. I started speaking out quite a bit saying, hey, I think that there's something really wrong here. And I think that I think it's a structural problem. I think it's a design problem. And I, I don't know who's responsible for fixing it. So that was that was my experience. And that was um, from like November 2014 to about June 2015 or so. Yeah. And what's crazy is you can see the arc between the seeds that might have been set then and to now. But I, I kind of want to also now like think maybe a bit more conceptually about like digital speech and, you know, debates yeah. around digital speech expression often lump digital and non-digital speech together. Um, like we discussed pe- speech online using familiar frameworks like the safety valve or the marketplace of ideas. Um, what do you see as key differences between digital speech and non-digital speech? And especially like what are the emergent properties of digital speech at scale? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I really liked um, my colleague at Stanford, Nate Persilli. Uh, we, we started having these conversations about um, – well, sorry. Let me let me step back. The we in that in that sense was not Nate. Actually, <laughs> my my mind was uh, racing a little bit ahead. Um, Nate personally wrote a really great framework for I think it was um, a UN commission that broke it down, and I think velocity and virality were the the kind of like two key terms that I that resonate most with with my assessment of the problem too. So there's always been speech. There's always been some component of virality, right? Um, oral culture, passing of information from person to person, the trust that we have uh, that comes from engaging with people that we know and and that we you know that we um, have kind of a uh, a familiarity with. We think they're like us, you know, that kind of feeling of uh, of, of being part of a a shared community, a shared identity. And so there's always been that that virality, but the infrastructure that it happens on is so different today. And so there's a couple things that were really distinctly different about social media. First, on the velocity front, you know, the internet just happens faster. It, you know, information moves much more quickly. Um, there's no waiting for a morning paper. There's no waiting until a broadcast goes. Everything happens as it happens. Uh, live is is one example of that, right? The, the idea that you can just turn on your phone and be streaming immediately um, whereas previously you would have content that was recorded, uh, maybe processed a bit, contextualized a bit. And so that contextualization aspect was a source, you know, there was friction inherent in that, but in a way that process of kind of verifying something or interpreting it or adding context to it was part of the process of, of helping people make sense of what they saw. And so the internet is so much of the experience of it is decontextualized. You know, how often do you pull up your um, pull up your phone or whatever? You go to your, your to your machine and you go to twitter.com or you pull up the app and you're like, "What the hell is this trend?" You know, <laughs> and you have to kind of like piece together what happened. Why are all these people talking about this thing? Um, but if you just look at the word, you you probably don't really know what happened. But oftentimes, it's something that's going to make you feel a certain way, right? It's a word that is relevant to a culture war conversation. And so you might have an opinion and a strong emotional reaction just by seeing the prompt, even if you don't actually know what's just happened. So there's this interesting dynamic of velocity, virality, knowing what so many people around you are seeing, um, you know, debating whether or not to go participate in that conversation, even if you don't really have all of the the facts or information yet. Um, 
anybody can tweet something and achieve massive reach, right? So that's also very distinctly different. Um, that ability to reach people used to be really very much more a uh, function of some sort of gatekeeping. You know, you had access to the media or you were media or you were um, influential because you were a leader in some way or a, a, again, media chose to cover you and that's no longer the way that things are. Uh, and there are many, many aspects of that that are far better than the old system, but there are also trade-offs there. And so the infrastructure of influence, the um, that that has really fundamentally changed, I think. And so a lot of what I've been interested in lately is not so much, is the information true or false? You know, I, I don't really love the term misinformation at this point. I feel like it's suffered from a lot of scope creep. Um, so it's not so much that it's a bad term as, as how it's applied. But I think that now we see this this dynamic happening over and over again, where it's more um, factions on the internet, behaving in such a way, competing for attention, trying to amplify their message. And it's rarely the factually nuanced stuff that gets amplified and goes viral. It's the stuff that can be distilled down into some sort of incendiary word that make people want to go and engage because they're like, oh, I know what that is. And they have an immediate emotional response to it. So I think that that the decontextualization and the movement towards that reactivity uh, and that ability to participate very directly are what's really different today. Thanks. And I think this also might get into some of the dynamics, but um, you wrote an article in Wired in 2018 yeah. titled Free Speech is Not the Same as Free Reach, drawing the distinction between content moderation and algorithmic amplification. And most of the public discourse around social media has been centered around content moderation. This is starting to change with recent disclosures and comments by the Facebook whistleblower, Francis Haugen. What do you see as the most important concepts people should understand about the algorithms that determine what we see? So the the phrase came about because, um, so I was uh, Center for Humane Technology, Tristan Harris and uh, Aza Raskin and uh, a few other folks who were who had been for, again, a very long time talking about, they were very interested in social media's impact on people, um, particularly in the context of attention. What did it mean when your attention was constantly, you know, Tristan's word for it was like hijacked. Um, what did it mean when you were constantly being like buffeted by, uh, by this, this kind of reactivity? And then my work sort of unexpectedly went from anti-vaxxers to ISIS to Russia, you know, <laughs> it was sort of a, I was interested um, and, and wound up getting pulled into a little bit more of the um, kind of societal level, um, how were particular groups being steered by influential figures? That was where I, I, I was much more captivated with kind of that side of the problem. But what we were talking about with that speech reach differentiation was that the dynamics were so much the same. And there was a rightful concern that moderation was going to be driven by some sort of um, political ideology, right? That, that there was going to be um, viewpoint-based, you know, censorship traditionally referred to kind of a viewpoint-based suppression of speech by the powerful. And at the time, of course, it was the state, you know, but in this particular case, we'll, we'll grant that social media platforms became really remarkably powerful. And so you can kind of debate um, to what extent the term censorship was accurate, but that was the, that was the dynamic um, at the time that we were, that we were thinking about this. Social media companies were trying to decide how to address these things. And one of the interesting dynamics with mis and disinformation, particularly at that time, was that the, a lot of the conversation was being directed to the substance of the content when in reality it was the dynamics of the distribution that were being manipulated in a lot of ways. There were kind of coordinated efforts to try to um, game trends on Twitter. There had been, and, and by that I mean, um, you know, things like bots. <laughs> if you think, it sounds so quaint to even say that to me, for, for me to say that today, but uh, but the idea that like bots were weighted the same as real people in a Twitter trend. And so if you had the largest bot army, you could potentially steer the conversation, right? And, and so, and that was kind of a, a remarkable thing. And so we were trying to think through what was the, what was the, what was the, the challenge that we were talking about? And 
really coming down to, on the idea that suddenly there was this, um, you know, platforms began to try to moderate a little bit more around those behavioral dynamics, around things like um, inauthenticity of actors or uh, attempts to, um, you know, to, to kind of game algorithms to increase reach or distribution. And so this question of how to think about putting guardrails on the system became much, you know, we really wanted to make sure it wasn't focused on your right to speak, but that instead, perhaps the guardrails could be focused more on what was being curated, what was being surfaced, what was what was reaching the public because of some sort of coordinated or manipulated dynamic as opposed to authentic conversation that was real genuine, you know, kind of grassroots topics that a lot of real people were interested in talking about. Another thing, another kind of facet of it, you know, that I was particularly interested in was actually the recommendation engine, right? You could, I believe, argue very uh, convincingly that you have a right to express an anti-vaccine opinion on Twitter, on, on Twitter or Facebook. Absolutely. But if there were groups that were dedicated to promoting vaccine misinformation, that were dedicated to promoting, again, at the time, it was the, the specific false claim about um, MMR causing autism, that perhaps the Facebook recommendation engine didn't need to push that to people. Perhaps, in fact, that kind of content could live on the platform, but not be proactively pushed out, not given kind of an algorithmic boost, not given additional reach because the platforms were just keying off of engagement. And so that was where a lot of the thinking behind that that original uh, article that I wrote, and, you know, Aza was the one who kind of said the words and put them up on the whiteboard, you know, <laughs> it was never really even intended to be um, you know, it was a meme, obviously, because again, in the age of competing for attention, coming up with a phrase that gets you attention is 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 part of the game. It was just the um, the real kind of underlying question at the root of that thinking was: Can you create an environment where high engagement, outrage-inducing, sensational, or false claims are not the things that are most likely to be recommended and to be given that reach? Thanks. And and maybe I'll hear I'll move to more your a term that you coined more recently in the Atlantic, the, the amplified propaganda or ampliganda. Um, that tends to follow certain tropes or exploit similar fears. And you've written about how this makes their spread predictable and probably seem particularly repetitive to someone like you who pours over the data. What are some of the similarities that you've seen across uh, misinformation or amplify ampliganda? And uh, how can we use the similarities to help break through them? Well, I think the the dynamic I was trying to get at in that essay was the what I see as a little bit of the the sort of factionalization um, of the internet at this point. I think again, there is a, a kind of an over focus on misinformation and the substance, as opposed to the norms that have kind of um, been established in the time since, you know, since 2015, since those anti-vaccine, um, kind of anti-vaccine network conversations that I was paying attention to. In the anti-vaccine dynamic back in the day, there were influencers and they really exercised a lot of control over what I called kind of the digital crowd, right? And I, and I wrote a lot about this on this blog called Ribbon Farm over the years. I was really interested in this idea of the influencer in the crowd. Excuse me. And the, 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 thing, the, the, the reason that I was so kind of captivated by that was that you had these figures who had managed to amass the trust of a community and then to put that community to work in some sort of, you know, by agitating them to take action and to speak and to act. And I watched that in the context of the anti-vaccine movement in 2015, because one of the things that they really wanted to do was to grow their movement. They wanted to expand it. And they were very interested in networking with the right, because again, this was in California. We were trying to pass a law to eliminate vaccine opt-outs. And so they began to make these appeals to personal liberty and uh, government overreach, arguing that routine school shots to send your kid to public schools were in fact government tyranny. And so the large online group that that most resonated with, uh, in, you know, in their explorations, um, was the uh, were the kind of Second Amendment, and at the time the hashtag was TCOT. It was kind of the Tea Party um, at the time. The top conservatives on Twitter was what that acronym stood for. 
And they found this community of people who were very receptive to the idea, again, this was early 2015, so still the Obama administration, um, that, that, you know, government tyranny was around the corner and this was like, yeah, just one more example of it. And so they really networked with these people, these, these, um, the anti-vaxxers on the left were networking with the sort of libertarians on the right to try to, um, to kind of push this stuff out. And, oh, sorry. Hold on one second. I don't know where it is, sweetie. <laughs> sorry. It's bedtime for the five-year-old. She just popped in. Um, so there was this dynamic that was happening where these, these groups were coordinating because they wanted to push out information to reach the public, to grow their numbers. And I started feeling as I watched this evolve over the years that this had in fact become really one of the dominant ways that many, many, many different groups by 2021 were using the internet. And there was a, you know, a lot, of, again, it wasn't necessarily false and misleading information. It was just competition for attention. And so to me, it struck me much more like propaganda. And I think that that became a loaded term over the years, um, over the decades. It, but ultimately, it really referred to fundamentally the idea of information with an agenda, right? Information designed to make people want to take an action. That was the original meaning. It was it was information that had to be spread, that you were in fact called upon. It was a religious calling. The term kind of comes from the Catholic Church for anyone I assume a lot of people haven't read the essay, so um, the, the term came from the Catholic Church saying, you must go and spread the one true faith to fight back against the Protestants was, was um, where this, this term originated. And I was really struck by the idea of information with an agenda, information designed to compel a feeling, designed to make someone take an action. But our understanding of propaganda over the years had become very much tied up in this notion that it was a top-down thing, that it was something that the powerful, the media, the institutions uh, kind of colluded to push a message to the public to deceive them in some way, to, to narrow their field of view and uh, and manipulate them into supporting a particular policy. Um, Noam Chomsky's phrase for it was uh, manufacturing consent, right? Manufacturing the consent of the governed. And I was kind of struck by the idea that all of a sudden we had actually created an information ecosystem where so much of the power was coming from the bottom, right? Where these exhortations to take action, to have a policy point of view, to weigh in on a culture war, it was much more akin to the dynamic that I'd been seeing back in 2015, where you had to find your, your fellow factions, your fellow fighters, and galvanize them to take action. And that was really the dynamic that I was trying to capture when I was talking about the profound power that ordinary people have today to spread messages and to kind of compel their, um, you know, their, their fellow travelers to, to take action. Yeah, that's super interesting. And I can see like how you're especially interested in the, the structures, the, the dynamics, the networks that allow this to happen. Um, and I think that's a really good point to delineate between, you know, the veracity and trying to pass judgment on whether something is true or not, and just judge like, should they be spreading at the rate that they do or something like that, right? Are we giving them as much attention as they deserve? And um, maybe, but to maybe get on to like maybe what makes certain ideas travel more than others, is there an asymmetry in the spread of, of, of certain information we could say versus the most true or um, let's say most, maybe harder to understand, but more nuanced information? Um, you know, does amplaganda or this, you know, amplified propaganda spread faster than correct information? And is this just something we kind of have to get used to in terms of the future? Or do you see like, like we're in Silicon Valley, right? Are there any features that can be built to deal with? Well, there was a, um, a study done, I believe it was by Sinan Aral out of MIT. Um, I hope I'm not getting that wrong. But um, there have been a, a couple of studies that have shown that false information, particularly sensational or outrage inducing, emotionally resonant information does travel faster because people feel compelled to share. I think it was something like six times as fast in these information cascades. There's, um, you know, one of the things that we do when we study these dynamics, um, there are various various disciplines that that kind of come into the research space here. Um, there are people who study the network structures. There's a professor named Damon Santola who wrote a book called Contagion that I think is fantastic. Um, and it looks and it's looking at what are the structures of networks that lend information that that propel information faster. What are the kind of like tightly coupled you know small world networks? I don't want to bore Clubhouse with like a, <laughs> a network science um, conversation here, but 
Um, but there's certain structures that lead to different types of information moving throughout a community. And so there's that kind of angle. Then there's the the professors who study rhetoric, for example. What what are the phrases that capture the public, that make the public want to amplify a message? Again, so there's some of it is the network structure, right? Some of it is the the meme, right? The is this catchy, is this captivating, is this rhetorically interesting? Um, I, I describe it sometimes as a combination of um, you need familiarity, right? You need a message that that someone grocks at least somewhat immediately. Then you add an element of novelty to that. You kind of um, twist it just a bit, you know, something unexpected that makes you sit up and pay attention so that it's not something that you've seen 500 times before. And then repetition. You've seen it repeated so many times that it, it comes to feel like canon. You're inclined to believe it. And so there's some of it is the network structure, the dissemination pathway. Some of it is the ways in which these different communities fit together and amplify the content of their, um, you know, kind of one faction boosts another faction because of sufficient amount of overlap. And some of it is the substance. And I think that that question, again, the relationship also between an influencer putting out a message and a crowd picking it up and spreading it because they feel compelled to do so is an interesting dynamic too. Um, in the essay for uh, for The Atlantic, I wrote about a particular case where a uh, an influencer, a political influencer in San Francisco by the name of Shahid Buttar, um, he was challenging Nancy Pelosi um, for the, uh, you know, for her house seat, and he and his, um, you know, his kind of uh, political supporters came up with this hashtag Pelosi must go, and he, I, I spoke to him about it. I actually called him, talked to him for about an hour about this hashtag. And I was like, tell me about, you know, tell me about your process and why this hashtag? And he said, you know, because it's something of a Rorschach test. A lot of different groups would see that and would potentially want to amplify it for their own reasons, which would propel it along. And, and he felt, and I think this was actually very astute, if he tweeted something about the things he cared about, right? Um, divesting from fossil fuels or uh, Medicare for all, the kind of policy areas that he really cared about, he just never saw the same lift as when he put out something that was one of these Rorschach tests, rile people up, Pelosi must go, you know, an imperative. And so the incentives, interestingly, you know, you have the network, you have the, but it's that message, it's that that rhetoric that is one of the things that is really instrumental in deciding what gets propelled along. And so to your question of what happens, you can change the structures of the networks, right? There, that is a, there is some, some potential there. Um, different social networks at various times uh, have actually thought about doing just that. There was one, and um, I'm pretty sure it's called Path. <laughs> I'm trying to remember now. I can see the icon in my head. Um, but it was, um, someone tell me if I'm wrong. It was um, Dave Morin's thing. And, and it, it was this idea that maybe you just needed like a smaller network, right? Maybe, maybe something intimate was actually better. Maybe you didn't need to be expressing your innermost thoughts to 70,000 people, but rather like, you know, a hundred people. So there's some, some debates about like, what is an optimal size for a social network? What is the optimal mechanism for the connection and the structure? And then on the other side, it's, are, are we normalized at this point to thinking that the way to behave online is to see something sensational and incendiary and to automatically hit the like or reshare button just because it, it kind of conforms to our pre-existing biases or, or, or you know, opinions about the world. And maybe that's a norm that we can undo or train people out of. Like, so there's some aspects where I think that design makes a difference, right? What does a recommendation engine recommend? What is curated into your feed? These are structural things that engineers and designers and data scientists in Silicon Valley can do something about, in fact. And we see in the Facebook papers evidence that internally, there are actually data scientists within Facebook who are advocating for doing just that. Then on the flip side, there's the, you know, the question of, um, can we help people realize that if something you see in your feed outrages you, maybe that's exactly the moment in time when you need to stop and reflect and think about whether or not that is in fact the message that you want to be amplifying. Maybe anger and outrage, instead of being something that we act on, is something that, that triggers more of like a, a stop and reflect response in some way. 
And to follow on this, to what degree, let's say these features, you know, while we're on the topic, do they kind of align again, they're aligned against the incentives that are built into social media networks, right? So you had mentioned Nate Persily's framework, right? The velocity um, aspect of it. Obviously, that velocity is good for a social network. There's more engagement, let's say, one could imagine, as it's currently built, right? (laughs) And so to what degree is any of these features like adding this friction, slowing people down, making people be, say, more considerate? Is it actually just not aligned with their active interests. And also maybe it could be within the interest of one particular social media network. But now I think you point this out that, you know, different influencers play different social media networks potentially against each other. So to what degree are, is it because there's competition among them that it might be in one particular's own interest, but actually the competition makes it so that we don't want to implement this feature because there's friction now on our platform and people will leave to others. I think that's a really, I mean, that, that is one of the areas where when people say self-regulation doesn't work, <laughs> that's exactly what they mean, right? Um, because, because design changes and design tweaks are fundamentally kind of at the, you know, at the margins. Um, they do require, you know, they require study, right? Which means if we make a design change or design tweak, uh, who's, who's in there verifying that it got done, what the impact was, et cetera, et cetera. You know, we can't rely on leaks from a whistleblower for, um, for every, uh, you know, every, every, every suggestion that a platform makes. So I think it is a, um, it's not an either or so much as an and at this point you know, there, there has to be some sort of regulatory oversight. I think the real challenge is what and how it, it's not, it, I, I worked on, um, the California bot bill <laughs> and I've, you know, it was, I've, I've, it really opened my eyes. It was a fantastic learning experience, I have to say, because it showed that, you know, some of the original drafts of the legislation, this attempt to regulate bots, first of all, it was passed, I want to say in around 2018, 2019. So long after the window when bots actually mattered anymore, right? Because Twitter had changed the waiting function by that point in response to actually, you know, public outcry and researchers publishing uh, papers suggesting that, you know, that that bots and, and other accounts were misrepresenting the public conversation. And you know, Twitter made a decision to um, to try to be a better steward of the public conversation. They tried to prioritize this, to make it a differentiator in some ways and to go after. Uh, again, you are, you are not, not allowed to run bots on Twitter. You still can if you're so inclined, but they don't have the same impact that they once did. However, California still decided it was going to pass a law to do something about this. And the... Regulation was ridiculously overbroad at first. You know, bot was described as like automated code on the internet or, you know, something that any, it was ridiculous. It was just a uh, vast sweeping thing that would have made any random chat bot on like yourbank.com, uh, <laughs> you know, a, a violation. And so there was, um, there were a lot of problems with it. And then it just got watered down, but they still, they still passed it. It wound up, wound up doing nothing. And it was an interesting insight for me to watch this process happen because I had done some some communicating with um, the authors of the bill, trying to refine the definitions, trying to to get it more. What is the notion of the harm you're trying to stop here, as opposed to this vague idea of the tech of automated technology being bad, which was not, in my opinion, where we should be going. And so there was a like a, a lack of understanding. We're at that point again now, I think, where there's a sense that there are a whole lot of things wrong with algorithmic curation, with recommendations, with inadvertent amplification, and you know, with the um, the algorithms as they're you know they're now called. Um, but the the kind of the challenges of actually getting in there and unpacking it and regulating it are where you know that that's kind of where we are today. And so the question of what time horizon we have to work with here, um, you know, is there some way for a regulator to compel a particular type of recommendation or advocate against another? I think the answer is really no. And so we're a little bit more in a state where in the short term, I think a lot of the action is going to come from self-regulatory action on social platforms and the sort of most helpful legislation to pass at this point would be something 
that would allow outside researchers more visibility into the changes that are made within the platforms? Is there some way that platforms that do choose to um, to be good stewards of the public conversation and make certain changes, that there is a way to have some sort of outside oversight uh, into that? I think public pressure does actually move the needle. I think the their own employees uh, becoming whistleblowers or speaking to the media and exposing the inner workings of the company is very detrimental to them. The the kind of uh, you know public sentiment hit that they take is problematic for them in the long run. And so I think the the question of how do you create the conditions uh, by which they feel compelled to change is going to be some combination of public sentiment continued ongoing um, exposés of, of some of the, the, you know, the whistleblower action, and then various governments coming in with narrowly tailored regulation that, uh, that kind of compels them to take some sort of, uh, some sort of corrective action and, you know, creates a system of oversight. I think that's a lot in what's in the public's mind and people just thinking about this, this problem as they face it. So we'll go to Sequoia first and then to Julie. Sequoia. There was just an article, a weekly newspaper Uh, called the San Jose Inside, and they just published an article about an unfortunate killing uh, shooting that happened in Gilroy. And they put the mayor, a woman who's running for mayor of San Jose, in the cover photo, which you know is going to get tweeted around and then associated with her. Uh, They they generally don't like Cindy Chavez very much. I'm just curious what your take on that sort of seeding of disinformation that then gets amplified by nefarious, you know, whether it's Russian or whatever other misinformation uh, machine might be activated. So, you, so you, yeah, using a mainstream publication and then getting a planted story or a picture like that and amplifying it. Yeah, well, I think that that dynamic of um, and I'm not familiar with the specifics. I, I gather from what you're saying that there was an incident um, and they chose to illustrate the story with a picture of this um, mayor who they you know, who who they don't like, um, maybe for, maybe for partisan reasons in the, in the media. And, and so the idea is to potentially like link it to her because her face is what appears in the share. And so there's some incendiary headline with her picture attached. There's, I think the media is an integral part, um, of how kind of narratives are constructed still, you know, so I want to make sure that I'm, I'm not, um, that I didn't imply that media and social media were different. I actually don't think that they really are at this point. Um, I think that the incentive structures of media, this desire to get clicks, get engagement, um, is, is unfortunately because so much of their content is consumed on social media, as opposed to people going to their domain or subscribing to their publication, um, that they are also plagued by this really terrible incentive structure that encourages them to um, to produce incendiary garbage headlines in hopes that you know one side or another will 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 pick things up and run with them. Um, I I tend to use um, disinformation as a as a term usually when I'm thinking about something with an intent to influence and a, and a deliberate intent to deceive. Also, um, it it definitely butts up against you know the, this kind of behavior, the kind of political dirty tricks that have been. Um, prominent in the, you know, in the American political discourse for, for decades, like long, long preceding social media, that idea of um, trying to link a candidate to an unfavorable policy by way of an embarrassing photo or something like that uh, is, is something that's happened for quite some time. I think the, the challenge with social media today is that, you know, as you note, um, the selection of the headline and the selection of the image really do Sometimes that's all that people see before they hit the retweet button. So there's there's a lot to be said for, uh, you know, for media also needing to be accountable um, to its readership in those particular situations. Thanks, Sequoia. But well, we'll go to Julie, and then after Julie, um, we'll go to Andy. Julie, thank you for joining us. Thank you, and um, Renee, this is fascinating. Um, you're incredibly articulate about this subject, and I so appreciate that. And I'm kind of wondering, like, as a thought leader on this particular topic, you mentioned it's, you know, there's been some doxing and there's, it seems like to be leading the charge on um, better policies and better practices around this. It's like you're putting yourself out there pretty heavily 
And I just got to imagine that it's a pretty big burden to bear. So I was just curious on that side of things. I, I, I really love what I do. <laughs> um, I, I feel very fortunate to be able to do it. Actually, I, I, um, back in 2015, when I first started feeling like things were not, you know, not, not quite headed in the direction that was ideal. And just, again, from the anti-vax experience, um, you know, I also kind of wondered if I was like chicken little, you know, <laughs> the sky is falling. Um, when in reality there was like, you know, like this was just my weird experience, um, in, you know, in, in the corners of the internet that had, um, that I had kind of begun to inhabit by way of this weird vaccine stuff. Uh, so it was, it was definitely interesting to see where it, you know, where, where it went to. Um, I think the, I, it's a really hard balance. I think I used to get asked right after the vaccine law was passed. A lot of, a lot of people were like, well, um, one of the problems that you identify in your work is that there are not enough people who are counter speaking. And yet, you know, do you, do you believe that more doctors and nurses need to be on Twitter kind of counter speaking against anti vaccine misinformation or more parents need to get themselves involved in the conversation? And I felt like it was a really challenging question because first I felt like the doctors and the nurses probably had an actual job to do, right? They had like lives to save. They shouldn't be like messing around on Twitter, like fighting with assholes in some hashtag. And to be perfectly honest, I still believe that, but, <laughs> uh, but here we are in the age of COVID. And so, um, quite, quite plainly, many of them have chosen to become very, very active participants in the hashtags because they really are the only ones in some ways with the moral authority and the, you know, in the firsthand direct experience to counter speak and to push back against some of this stuff. And so I'm very grateful, um, that they have chosen to do it. Similarly, on the parent front, uh, again, if if the only voices in the conversation are the most extreme voices, then that is what's going to dominate share of voice. And I, I also feel very strongly that for a very long time, there's been an asymmetry of passion on a lot of issues. Vaccines were one, and I am more than a little bit frustrated that we got to the uh, the you know the the age of COVID without a strong countervailing pro-vaccine community, both parents, but also of public health officials and and other folks um, who have the networks to obtain share of voice in that conversation, whereas the anti-vaccine activists have been actively developing those networks uh, for years. And so I absolutely, you know, there's a real trade-off to choosing to insert yourself into a public conversation, particularly in incendiary topics or culture war issues or hot button issues. But I do believe that it is increasingly more and more important for people to speak up um, because otherwise it is the only kind of the most, um, you know, the most extreme, um, you know, voices who choose to participate. And so having that, having that participation really truly be expanded to include everybody is a critical, you know, is where we need social media to go. And in order to do that, the platforms do have to be much, much better at cracking down on things like harassment and organized brigading and the kinds of actions that we've begun to see platforms take only now, actually, during the pandemic, as they've they've tried to crack down on networks that are, you know, actively trying to flood the reviews of pro-vaccine pediatricians with, you know, zero star reviews and, and this kind of juvenile stuff or, or showing up and, and, um, live streaming protests outside of the homes of public health officials to try to make them feel so intimidated that they quit their jobs. So I do think, unfortunately, as, as high as the stakes are, we need better harassment protection and, and better anti-brigading tools and things like that from the platforms. But at the same time, we really, really do need uh, voices of authentic people in the conversation. And so I, I hope that um, some of the work that I do and that others do, putting themselves into those conversations uh, inspires others to participate as well. Oh my gosh, Renee, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Julie. Um, we're going to go to Andy, and then after Andy, we'll kick it to Greg. Thanks, Peter, and thank you, Renee, for joining us today. Really great to hear from you. Um, my question would be, looking around the world, <clears throat> do you have a view as to whether regimes who exert strict control over the internet and media outlets in a way that we champions of free speech uh, find very unpalatable and I'm sure would never condone, whether they are actually in fact faring better against false propaganda or deliberate disinformation. 
That is a great question. Um, we don't do that kind of research at, in, at SIO. So I don't have a, you know, any kind of, um, kind of quantitative uh, response to that. I was in, I was in Singapore, um, at a conference and the minister of home affairs and the law, I believe was his title. Um, probably the most, you know, I, it's, it's very rare, <laughs> I think, in the U.S. that you go to a conference and you hear a, a politician or a minister speak and you come away and you think like, wow, that was just that really just blew me away. But this individual um, was this was at a conference on social media and it was specifically mis and disinformation. A lot of it was focused on influence operations in Southeast Asia, you know, what China was doing in the space, you know, but it did his 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 keynote started with a history of propaganda dating back to ancient Greece and just kind of walking through to the modern era. And the idea of propaganda as a destabilizing force and the fundamental value of stability uh, that he saw as really core to the value of the, you know, the kind of average Singaporean and that he was, you know, so he was articulating this law that they had just announced um, saying that if the government told you to take content down, uh, the, the platforms were compelled to take content down. And this was a law that, you know, we referred to and, and perceived in the U.S. and U.S. media as a censorship law. This was the government of Singapore saying to social media companies, you will take down this information that we, the government, have determined to be false. And this is the sort of thing that's very ant you know, antithetical to American values, right? To American values of freedom of speech, to American values of the right to be wrong, you know, <laughs> the uh, the right to, to challenge your government, uh, the right to spread misinformation about a particular political candidate because you're smearing them in an election. You know, this, this, that is not, in fact, uh, a crime. Um, and so it was interesting because there was very much in the minister's speech, this appeal to stability. And I remember him kind of the um, media that was covering the conference asking uh, me, um, <laughs> so how is that freedom of speech working out for you guys in the U.S. right now? Because it seems like there's a whole lot of chaos over there. This was kind of early in the Trump presidency. And, you know, and I, I was I've never been I've never felt so on the spot in my life, to be honest. <laughs> but um, it was really it was a very, very interesting question, because what we have always held um, in this country, and, and and what I still sincerely believe is that the best antidote to bad ideas or bad policies is, in fact, that counter speech. And yet, I don't think that we have a information environment at this time where we are having effective dialogue and debate and counter speech. And so, I don't think that the that the social network platforms, as they are designed today, are particularly helpful or beneficial for us to achieve the value that I still nonetheless believe is the value that we should be striving for. So that, I think, is one of the um, the real kind of quandaries facing us as we try to think through what we want to do as we build a, you know, better social network or what, you know, whether we choose to inject friction or rethink recommendations, rethink curation. How do we decide what to surface and how to facilitate counter speech absent mass harassment? That, I think, is ultimately where we need to be going in this conversation, not saying, well, in the short term, the government has decided that you are going to take that post down in the interest of the stability of the republic, right? Um, and, and and that, I think, is where it's a, it was very interesting to me to to be there, to hear this speech, to to take in this, this very alternative perspective, um, and then to think about it in the context of what are the values that we are trying to produce? What are the values that we want, in fact, to export? And is the structure that we have today enabling us to do that? I would argue the answer is no, but that we should be working towards it, not uh, taking lessons from authoritarians. Thank you, Andy. Next up, I had said Greg. And after Greg, we'll kick it to Cami. Greg, what? Thanks, Peter, and and thank you, Renee, for for joining us. I've I've really enjoyed uh, what you had to say. Uh, my question regards uh, the types of of network or information cascades that you were describing earlier. We we've known how these cascades work at least since the original Watts and, and Strogatz paper in 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 ninety eight, and 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 many people have. This is a very, very well studied area. I covered it in 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 my last book. Uh, in the financial markets, they decided to take uh, a, a step to control them 
in what they called circuit breakers, which are yes. sort of, uh, you know, temporary pauses. What do you see as the potential of, uh, in, in terms of putting circuit breakers uh, in, in into social media or, or taking a similar uh, strategy? Do you see any potential in that, or or, or is that? Yeah, I'm I'm a I'm a huge fan actually <laughs> of that model. Um, I was a I was a derivatives trader back in the day, and you know I remember I was a um, I was a, um, I did a Latin American equity derivative arbitrage strategy in 2008, and so I just kind of was at this um, at this firm doing high frequency trading, and I remember the market just halting, right, limit down, limit down, limit down during those days. But but also more broadly, the idea of circuit breakers um, when news broke in a stock to give people an opportunity. Um, to digest information and to not be reactive and to not whipsaw uh, in response to uh, panic, right? And to and, and I think that there's actually some real value there. Um, I've written about circuit breakers in the context of friction from a self-regulatory perspective. Again, the idea that you could change, that you could use design to achieve these things. Um, in the context of, you know, one representative example would be for narrowly tailored high harm areas, right, like health misinformation, which can have a very serious impact on people if they choose to make a decision based on something, uh, or in the context of an election, particularly in the vicinity of uh, of actual election day or, or, or period of open voting, you could envision a situation where uh, an increase in velocity, right, uh, kind of commensurate with some some virality kind of trigger for a particular topic, triggering a human review, right? Some sort of oversight where instead of the algorithm seeing that engagement as a signal to pump it out to even more people, it in fact becomes a signal for someone with oversight capability, if you will, to look at it and, you know, decide um, what to do with it, basically. And so there would be this idea of um, the circuit breaker becoming something that rather than allowing it to continue to snowball and to spread, someone is responsible for oversight. Uh, you know, somebody looks at is that maybe it's a fact check. Um, maybe it's a, is this P, is this video real? You know, again, trying to assess, is this the kind of thing where we could potentially um, throttle something that is going rapidly viral to give, you know, to create an opportunity to make sure that it's not a viral hoax or a false claim or something that's going to be harmful and piloting that in certain very kind of narrowly tailored areas to start. And, and I think that there is some potential for that. Um, I think, again, this, this kind of goes back to the speech reach kind of dynamic. Um, I think that there are people who would argue that a circuit breaker is a form of censorship and unfettered virality is just fine. Uh, I, I think that there are, though, opportunities, as you, as you know, the reason for it in finance is to prevent, um, you know, prevent panics from triggering bad actions. And I think that there is an opportunity to think about that in the context of information markets outside of finance as well. Thank you, Greg. We're going to go to Cami, And after Cami, we'll kick it to Shireen. Cami. Thank you, Peter, for hosting this discussion. Um, Renee, I'm a huge fan of the Stanford Internet Observ uh, Observatory and all the good work that uh, that it does. My question to you is, knowing what you know now, where do you see the landscape of traditional media and social media within the next five to ten years? And if you could affect change, if you don't like the way it's going, what would be the one thing that you would so I think we continue to see more fragmentation in media. Um, we, I, my main, my main two, I guess I'd say I've got kind of two main concerns. Um, the first is that the fragmentation means that we just retreat further and further into um, the kind of bespoke reality that most appeals to us, right? Where we never have to see a divergent viewpoint or an opinion we don't like or, a, you know, political uh, content from the other side, right? And, and, and I don't think that, again, per the question about American values and the deliberative debate and um, counter speech and coming to consensus, I think that the combination of the proliferation of outlets does mean that if you choose, you know, you kind of have a finite amount of time to, uh, you know, in your day to consume the news, uh, algorithms are going to curate the thing most likely to resonate with you. 
they're probably going to curate something that you're kind of inclined to agree with. You're maybe going to spend more time on that. Um, I, I think that that environment, you know, the, the one, <laughs> there's a lot of bad things about the olden days of like, you know, five channels, but I think people did tend to see the same information and then formulate opinions on it. That's never going to happen again. So I don't want to sound like it's nostalgia for the bad old days. I think it's more of a, given that this is the new environment, how do we, um, how do we think about restoring some of that kind of shared basis of fact or, um, you know, ensuring that we're seeing the same kind of topics, that the same things are surfaced, uh, so that we can all, you know, agree on what's important and, and debate the issues. The other area, and I think this may go kind of hand in hand is the sort of death of local news. And that I think is, um, is really tragic and also very problematic as well, kind of for the same reasons. Um, the, you know, knowing what's going on in your community, in your local media, shouldn't be something that you get digested, you know, through national media only at times when there's some sort of crisis, you know, living in San Francisco. Um, I think anybody who lives there has seen our various local foibles, uh, you know, become the subject of um, national media stories that don't necessarily get everything right. At the same time, the question of how to fund local journalism, make sure that the stories are reported accurately, that, you know, everyone is kind of operating from that same, at least roughly uh, basis in fact, or awareness of what issues are important is something that we used to rely on local media for. And so one of the areas that I think is, um, you know, is, is very important, is very pressing, is finding ways to restore that ecosystem. I think that the end of, of local news, um, the, or the kind of local news deserts create opportunities for just sort of really manipulative, um, kind of garbage to, to come in and, uh, and take their place, like low cost to produce, uh, just sort of repurposing, um, a skeleton of a story. I think Columbia Journalism Review wrote a great uh, article on this. It was about, um, they called it pink slime. Uh, and I would definitely encourage anyone to Google, uh, the CJR and pink slime and, and just have a look at what takes the place of, uh, of local news in these deserts where local media no longer exists. Thank you uh, for that question, Cami. For the last question, um, we're going to go to Shireen, um, who has also done work on disinformation and misinformation. Shireen, what? Hey, Renee. Hi. <clears throat> um, so my, my question is, um, in terms of this conversation, which I think is important about the, the, the free speech part, because I think we, we land on this a lot, especially with disinformation. Um, the way in which we now know Facebook knew about troll farms pretending to be Black people, allowing those those groups to, uh, th those Facebook groups, allowing them to have more space um, and, and, and more amplification than the actual Black voices on the platform, th that many of those voices were banned and suspended, even though they were accurate and, of course, had the same same freedoms, of course, as anyone else. What do you think is the solution to that when people think that the, when people don't understand that if you have bad speech that is falsely amplified and not even from the real community, how do you, how is that, how do you counter that? And how do you counter that with the expectation that the platforms won't remove or deplatform the actual Black voices who is trying to put those voices out there? I think it's really interesting that people talk about free speech, but but they don't spend in any time, any energy on, on on speech of certain people who are literally being removed from the platforms. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, one of the real key frustrations, I think for, um, you know, for many of the black scholars that I've seen doing disinfo research over the years was that they weren't taken seriously. Right. And, uh, and I know, you know, again, as, um, my issue was different, it was, it was <laughs> parenting and anti-vaxxers, but feeling like, like, you know, chicken little, but maybe also Cassandra, right? We were like, no, no, really, I think this is a problem. <laughs> sure, it'd be great if somebody looked at it, you know. Um, and uh, and and then you don't get taken seriously, and then uh, you know it's it's uh, it's phenomenally frustrating. I think with some of those, um, first of all, there's there's the challenge of who is doing the moderation, you know, and and uh, are they equipped to to do that moderation? Do they understand the nuances of the communities that they're moderating? That's a huge problem. Um, that speaks to the Black community experience on Facebook. That also is something that we've seen with regard to 
uh, minority communities elsewhere in the world, right? That that same problem. Um, if you're if all of your employees in a given country are of one particular um, socioeconomic or ethnic or um, you know demographic group, then you do kind of uh, have these blind spots that make things like that happen. And as we've seen both in and out of the U.S., uh, sometimes particularly disastrous consequences. I think the now we're at a point where I I think the platforms are listening a little bit more than they were in 2016. I know that that's not always true, but I, I do see um, you know, groups of scholars who go and sit down and try to walk through. This is how our group is impacted. And I think that that engagement is something that really needs to continue to happen. The the problem that we that we have, and I think this is common to so many, this this is where again when I was trying to get into how I think self-regulatory um action alone isn't enough, is that there isn't anything to compel accountability when they get it wrong. And it's not enough to just get an apology um, when there are potentially really, really very deep harms um, that have come out of this. And that I think is you know, that, that is the area where I <laughs> I am sincerely hopeful that many of the policy experts that are doing work on this come up with constructive means for regulation and oversight at this point. And I hope that we are now at the point where we can begin those extremely important conversations. My fear is that those conversations are often like very boring, right? The, the policy conversation is kind of the most boring part, who regulates when and how. I've tried to write those articles too, and they're, they're just, they're, they're, they don't get a lot of attention. And so really at this point, it has to be kind of direct engagement between civil society groups and lawmakers reaching out and saying, this was our experience. This is what we see in these files. We need you to represent our group as you think through uh, you know, we, we want you to be aware of this experience as you think through the regulatory process um, that, that's going to be coming. I wish I had a better answer. I mean, I remember a lot of your work in the early days, the folks who did the Your Slip is Showing hashtag and uh, some of the other stuff that just got ignored and was, you know, was, was born out to be right several years later. But we always ask this of the folks who come on, on to join us um, to leave with some parting thoughts whether it's you know positive, negative, or some somewhere in between, what would you like to leave our audience with? Um, to- um, I think I think we are actually about to embark upon so many of these questions. You know, how, what do we want social media to look like? And I do think that people need to be speaking up and speaking out and offering their opinions and, and really shaping that conversation. So I would say, whatever you know, whatever kind of um, field you're in get out there and participate in the conversation. It's it's so important, I think, to to not have it be <laughs> the, the, the kind of same voices speaking all the time. And, and so I hope that uh, more people with strong opinions about what our social ecosystem looks like and how it can be made better um, begin to contribute to that conversation, you know, on Twitter and uh, in, in Clubhouse and places where, you know, we can gather together to discuss the system that we actually want to create. That's all we have for you today. Again, huge thanks to Renee DeResta, Stanford Internet Observatory, Peter Chow for filling in for Justin during the interview, our audience for their questions, and to you for being here. All of our events are taped live. Anyone who wants to can join to ask our guests a question. For more information on how to join us in past episodes, visit us at pm101.live. This has been Politics and Media 101, produced in partnership with Clubhouse. I'm Jeff Browning on behalf of Justin Higgins, our co-founder and our team. Thank you very much for being here. We hope to see and hear from you soon.